Hello, welcome to the first lecture of uh, uh, stories. This is um, a, this will be a series of lectures actually dealing with energy storage, and in particular uh, hybrid energy storage. Today, I will give some introduction about uh, the importance, let's say, of energy storage for our society, as and with a special view on some uh, on the role of electrochemistry in this field. My name is. Uh, Stefano Vassellini, I'm the coordinator of STORIES, and I work at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, where I'm professor. Uh, just a brief presentation, some contact details. If you want to get in touch with me, please do not hesitate to send me an email or a message. OK? I also take the chance to present the in institute in which I work, is the Helmholtz Institute Ulm. Helmholtz Institutes are uh, typical uh, collaboration of an Helmholtz Center and a university. So um, in particular, the Helmholtz Institute Ulm is composed of four institutes um, or the founding institutions, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, which is the um, Helmholtz Institute, the University of Ulm, which is our host university. And there um, we have also um, the, the Center for Solar Energy and Hydrogen Research, ZSW, which is uh, close to us actually here in Ulm and the German Aerospace Center. Uh, the institute was established in 2011. The director is my colleague, Professor Fischner. I'm the deputy director right now. The personnel is about 150 people involved, 19 principal investigators several PhD students and postdoc and administrative groups. This is uh, our funding, just to give you an idea, we received the five, the standard 5.5 million euro a year as basic funding from the federal government and the state of Baden-Württemberg. We have a contribution of DLR, which is actually between half and 0 0.5 and 1 million euro a year. And plus, in 2022, we already achieved uh, 7.3 million euro uh, third party funding. So, but why uh, why storage and why energy storage? I mean, energy storage is becoming more and more important. Uh, one of the reasons is uh, uh, the action of the European Union that wants to become decarbonized by the year 2050. Okay, this is actually a very good uh, um, target, but it is uh, also rather uh, difficult to achieve because uh, uh, we right now make use of, of uh, a lot of energy, which is mostly coming actually from uh, fossil fuels. Okay, here you in this uh, lower uh, graph, you can see, for example, the uh, requirement, the final energy consumption in the year 2020, 2019, sorry, so before the COVID crisis. Okay, and you see that uh, um, there, there is a huge need of energy, but for transportation, households, industry, and other services. Okay, if we really want to decarbonize Europe, we need to secure energy needs for, for these applications. I mean, none of us wants Everybody wants to move, uh, wants to have uh, pretty comfortable houses, and we also need industry to run to uh, for our economies. This is extremely important. So energy storage is definitely extremely important. I'm an electrochemist, and uh, and then uh, I'm always looking at the electrochemical solution, and I'm always puzzled by this statement made by a Nobel Prize from Germany, actually, long ago. Uh, the path leading to the solution of the most difficult of all technological questions. The delivery of cheap energy must be discovered by electrochemistry. So I really believe in this statement. And uh, uh, not only me, I mean, many people is, believes in this statement. And uh, we, our present target is actually um, uh, the, the enable a sustainable energy future. Okay. So electrochemistry has done already a lot, and especially batteries have done already a lot for our society. I mean, uh, they are used, for example, for medical devices, but they also changed completely the uh, way we communicate in our society. I mean, uh, it is thanks to the lithium ion batteries that now uh, 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 cellular phones can be actually smartphones. We can exchange a lot of information through them because with the previous 
battery chemistry, this was practically impossible. And, and finally, recently, electromobility is also becoming a reality. And this is, again, due to the fact that lithium-ion batteries are extremely uh, well performing. And this has been recognized by the, the scientific community with the Nobel Prize in chemistry given in 2019 to three of the main players, uh, early players in the lithium-ion battery field, uh, John Goodenough, uh, Stanley Whittingham, and Akira Yoshino. Um, as I said, uh, electromobility is already becoming a reality. And uh, recently in a study, um, we performed together with uh, uh, some uh, national agencies like BMBF from Germany, DOE from US, NIDA from Japan, and the Chinese Academy of Science. It, it appears very really clear that uh, there is a, a path toward the uh, uh, battery powered transportation, and this will keep growing in the next 10, 15 years, and most likely will be pow powered, let's say, by lithium ion batteries and uh, maybe lithium ion batteries. The, the trends for the forecast for battery production, lithium ion batteries production, is just uh, extreme, I would say, with. Uh, um, uh, the growth of uh, more than maybe an order of money in the next uh, uh, few years, actually, so we, which is also raising some industrial concerns, but this is still um, uh, feasible. Okay. Um, why battery powered vehicles are taking the lead? Well, this comes from uh, um, the, the very efficient use of renewable energies that uh, uh, battery-powered uh, vehicles uh, can, can make, actually. So if we consider, uh, if we compare, for example, a battery electric vehicle with a fuel cell vehicle or with a, uh, a conventional IZ engine powered or fueled with a liquid, uh, liquid fuel produced via renewable energy, we see that practically there is no comparison among the, the, the three possibilities. I mean, batteries are extremely efficient, efficient, and overall they can keep 73% of, uh, of uh, overall efficiency in trans transformation from the renew renewable energy to the, the energy actually used to uh, power the car, while with hydrogen or even worse with power to liquid these uh, efficiency drops down dramatically. And actually this is uh, the reason why Tesla, which is the, the first car maker who heavily invested or who it's only actually uh, uh, proposing a, a battery powered electric vehicles. Now it's capitalized more than Toyota and the three German car makers together, okay? Um, so uh, there is a clear, a clear uh, uh, indication that even for uh, heavy duty transportation, um, battery powered vehicle will actually be uh, very soon um, on sale and commercial production. Uh, some facts in the transportation sector. I mean, this is obviously reflecting, and you see here the the comparison of the uh, um, share of um, or the share of actually electric vehicles versus all kind of vehicles in the European Union. And you see that the sum of hybrid, plug-in hybrid and electric vehicles in the first quarter of 2022 reached about 44%, that actually uh, hybrid electric vehicles now are, um, are um, exceeding the quote of diesel uh, vehicles. And very soon, this gap will be uh, will be much larger, and and uh, in general, the fraction of electric vehicles will be larger and larger. So, um, if we can consider that the transportation sector, or at least the the road transportation sector, is kind of uh, uh, solved, um, we still need to generate the energy for this uh, for this uh, sector to charge the batteries in the vehicles. And, and there is uh, also in this uh, case, there, is, there are still concerns about the fact if renewable energy can actually um, manage the energy transition. 
So also here, we did the very simple calculation together with the university, Professor Barelli at the University of Perugia, we did a very uh, simple calculation, okay? So we took the overall energy need of Europe in 2018. So again, before the COVID crisis, and this was about 21,400 terawatt hour, okay? And then we estimated, we assumed that uh, all the renewable energy is only coming from photovoltaics. So we did not consider uh, um, uh, wind generators or geothermal, nothing else, only photovoltaics. We took just by chance the solar radiation in Perugia because the University of Perugia made this calculation, which is about 1,500 kilowatt hour per square meter. And we assume 20% uh, collection efficiency for the photovoltaic. And, and you see that actually uh, for to supply the all energy uh, needed by Europe in 2018, we only need about 62,000 63, square kilometers. Again, uh, which correspond to the area of, uh, you know, three, uh, not even three regions of Italy. So Sicily, Sardinia, and half uh, Puglia. Obviously, nobody of us is considering to uh, to, code, to cover these uh, uh, three uh, regions of Italy with photovoltaic panels. But if you consider that in Italy there are already about twenty thousand square kilometers of urbanized territory, which could co be covered by uh, photovoltaic panels, this is already making clear that it's not such a tough issues to produce all. Um, uh, the energy we need via photovoltaics. And actually what we need, if you look at the, these black stripes on the, on the European map, this is the more or less the area that we should cover uh, in the southern part of Europe where there is uh, the highest uh, solar radiation barrier to ensure the energy needs. So the, the, the point is, are uh, um, renewable energies available in Europe to cover the need, the energy needs of Europe. This is kind of, uh, the, the answer is yes, there is plenty of energy, renewable energy available in Europe to, to satisfy our uh, energy need. The real problem is not there. I mean, the, the real problem is, uh, so it's it's not the question, we need more solar energy, we need more so wind power, this is for sure. Huh? But the real question is that we need more energy storage because we, this, both solar energy, wind power, they are intermittent um, energy sources and we cannot be sure that they are available all the time. For example, solar energy is not available overnight, okay? So we need more energy storage. And actually we believe that the seasonal annual energy storage is the key to renewable energy use energy independence, and this is coming up uh, now, especially with the big problem of, of the big crisis between uh, uh, generated by Russian uh, Ukraine, let's say, and also the decarbonization, which is uh, um, the, this important target of the European Union. Okay. Well, uh, why is this is easy? This is a very nice uh, uh, figure that I took from the uh, EE's uh, uh, energy storage target 2030 and 2050 report. There is also a video. Uh, these are the active links if you want to have a look at them. Obviously in summer we can produce much more energy than what we need, but definitely we need to shift this uh, uh, excess energy to the winter, especially in the northern country, eh, where where we need a lot of eating during winter, and uh, to again we did some uh, simple calculation based on the assumption I mentioned before um, regarding both the the seasonal accumulation and the daily accumulation of energy, which are needed. Okay, so if we take the typical distribution, let's say. <clears throat> of uh, solar energy along the year and along the day. Uh, again, these calculations were done uh, based on, uh, on the um, mid-Italy, let's say, solar radiation. Okay, we, 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 seem, we calculated that for the all European needs, we need about 4,000 terawatt hour to balance the missing uh, um, solar radiation in winter. 
and for Italy, the needs is about one tenth. Okay. And in terms of daily accumulation, so to cover the daily and night cycle, we need about 20 tera, 30, 29 terawatt hour uh, for the whole Europe, and again, about one tenth uh, for Italy, so three terawatt hours. Um, these numbers are still big, but actually, um, uh, th th this is the energy need we need to uh, the energy storage or the accumulation that we must uh, uh, have in order to be sure that we safely make through next winter. This year, for example, uh, right now what you know, they are doing it via, via gas storage and oil storage, uh, also uh, resulting from the crisis I was mentioning before, which. Uh, uh, Europe is not, it's not sure that we will get in Europe the gas we will need during next winter for heating and industrial and all other uh, and electricity supply. And, and right now, the way we are starting uh, energy actually for next winter is pumping gas uh, underground. Um, and this is actually also the first time that uh, the, the real need of energy storage it's coming out. I mean, so far, this has never been a big problem because what we have done, we just uh, burned gas and oil during winter. But uh, um, if we really want to go toward decarbonization, this will not be possible anymore. Um, and just to give you, uh, again, an idea of how important is energy storage, I took another slide from this report made by EASE. It's a rather interesting report. I strongly recommend all of you to read it carefully, uh, which is showing how important is storage if we increase the fraction of renewable energy, okay? So if we only go up to maybe 60% on, on a regional grid, and, and we are talking about electricity and not all energy, okay? Then uh, we only need storage in, uh, in on the hourly base, okay? But if we really go up above 60%, then we really need storage on the, on the day week, but especially on the seasonal, uh, when we want to get to full, uh, to full uh, um, um, renewable uh, energy uh, production, okay. Yeah, so uh, in stories, we are addressing all uh, needs, energy needs. I mean, from the small scale to the large scales, there is no, uh, not any single uh, strategy uh, technology that can cover everything. So we definitely need different storage technologies for, for example, high power or very short, uh, for very short times and, and rather different uh, storages. I mean, in this graph, we are kind of showing uh, what kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, I mean, what are the most appropriate uh, storage uh, technologies for the different needs, okay? But as I mentioned before, and as it became very evident with the, the, with the uh, Ukrainian war, is that actually the long-term storage, it's, it's definitely extremely important, okay? And it's definitely on a very large scale. So for, to be sure that we can uh, make through the next winter, we always should uh, store on summer when we have a lot of photovoltaics available, this 4,000 tera, 4, terawatt hour, okay? And it would be better if we produce this energy in Europe rather than somewhere else in the world, just to avoid to have again the problem of of uh, uh, supply. Okay. So, and as I said before, this is definitely possible. The need of energy to cover the day and night cycle is much lower; it's about ter thirty terawatt hour. And among the most uh, important important or uh, the most known common uh, storage technologies. I think uh, uh, for the daily night storage, there are several different uh, approaches possible already, like pump, pump idle storage. Even uh, batteries can be okay for, for example, house uh, or, or the small scale energy storage. Redox flow batteries are definitely okay, even for a little bit longer timing. 
compress the ear can also work. Okay, but uh, the real problem is actually on the long-term storage, for which right now the only the only uh, process, the only technology, the only two technologies which may substantially help us are thermal energy storage, which is definitely not scaled up so far to that scale. And the emerging technology is actually hydrogen, which has been uh, proposed to be the solution for almost uh, um, every problem. Okay. Nonetheless, and this is something that is coming now into, uh, into play, and you might have heard about it, it's uh, the use of reactive metals are energy uh, storage carriers. This is something that we are also proposing actively here at KIT, and, uh, but, but it's also coming from industry right now. I, I recently heard an announcement or a press release from a, an aluminum company in, in, in Germany who proposed to actually burn aluminum power, aluminum powder into the, into the coal uh, power plants because aluminum can burn and generate a lot of energy as we will see actually in a couple of slides, okay? So reactive metal are actually, uh, some of these reactive metals like uh, aluminum, magnesium, calcium, silicon, sol sodium, they are rather abundant, so they will not suffer of, of any limitation, which is, um, for example, present for uh, some other uh, metal or materials or metals or elements which are needed for other technologies, for example, lithium for lithium ion batteries, but also even more dramatic are some catalysts for electrolyzer fuel cells to produce hydrogen which are usually uh, pretty rare. Actually, most of them do not even, yeah, they appear down here. Hopefully you can see the arrow, but oh, iridium, platinum, palladium, these are heavily, ruthenium, these are heavily used in, uh, in hydrolyzer inferences. So definitely the, the use of reactive metal would free most of the countries from, from this problem. I mean, aluminum, iron, sodium, they are very widely widely available everywhere. So um, to enter into some details, let's say this this is the beast to beat. Okay. So right now our energy storage, we call it energy storage, it's actually burning fuels. Okay. And here you see the um, energy performance of of conventional fuels. So natural gas is not that much. Compressed natural gas has a little bit. I mean, the energy is always ranging between 12. Gravimetric uh, energy density is always ranging between 12 and 15 kilowatt hour per kilogram, which is a pretty good number. OK, obviously, uh, natural gas has the highest because it has the largest content of hydrogen inside. But on the other end, and uh, this is also important for the seasonal energy uh, energy storage when we really need the large amount of, uh, of, uh, of uh, fuels. The volumetric energy density is also important. And in this case, the liquid fuels offer much better performance than uh, um, natural gas or compressed natural gas or even liquefied natural gas. Okay, It's about 30% more than liquefied natural gas. So what, what is being proposed, what has been proposed or it's being proposed uh, in the last uh, uh, couple of years, it's hydrogen, which definitely has a, a, an extremely good gravimetric energy density. I mean, we know that hydrogen can offer a very good uh, gravimetric energy density, but uh, the, um, the volumetric energy density, which is what matters for the, especially for the seasonal storage, it's, it's rather poor. It's in the when, when we liquefy hydrogen, it is on the order of, uh, of uh, the, the compressed natural gas, not even the liquefied natural gas, okay? And if we consider compressed uh, hydrogen to 700 bars, this is uh, 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 even lower, okay? Um, other fuels that have been uh, proposed are ammonia. Uh, that's definitely an interesting chemical because it has, a, again, a lot of hydrogen. But you see that from 
liquid ammonia does not have a much better energy uh, volumetric energy density than uh, um, liquefied hydrogen, although it's easier to liquefy ammonia than hydrogen, but the gravimetric energy density is much lower. So what we will are kind of uh, um, proposing are these reactive metals. And uh, there, it's not a new, um, something very new. Reactive metals were already proposed uh, during the first oil crisis, so in the uh, 1970s, okay, as, uh, as possible fuels. And besides some chemicals like boron and beryllium, which are not abundant and also not very safe, but there are many other metals which can offer very good volumetric energy densities, okay? Among them, aluminum and silicon are maybe the best because they offer uh, more than 20 kilowatt hour per liter uh, and, and still about 10 uh, kilowatt hour per kilogram, which is not too bad, nine, okay? But also other metals can, uh, you know, they, because they are very easy easy to store. So, and since it's a seasonal energy storage, the, the gray metric energy density does not really matter. Even sodium is still interesting, although it has uh, only a little bit better uh, performance. So the, the, the clear, uh, the, the, the message here is that a reactive metal can really store large amount of energy in, in, in much smaller volume than hydrogen. So if we consider aluminum, this is one of my preferred cases. If we want to store one terawatt hour of, of energy via uh, in aluminum, we only need uh, 42,000 cubic meters, okay? If we want to store the same amount of energy as uh, liquid hydrogen, then we need 10 times more volume, 425 cubic meter. And in compressed hydrogen is even higher, okay? So to give you a, a simple example, um, if we take a football field and we put under a football field seven meters of aluminum, uh, we are we practically store uh, about one terawatt hour. Okay, if you want to do the same with hydrogen, you need uh, you need uh, only in in terms of liquefied hydrogen without the container, you need a building which is seventy meters tall. This is the concept. Okay. One cubic meter of aluminum provides 20 mega, megawatt hours, which is more or less um, the amount of energy you can, uh, uh, you need for uh, um, an household in Europe. Pretty large household, okay. Um, still, uh, again, uh, trying to uh, avoid, I mean, to use, substitute oil and natural gas, there is a, a chemical, I mean, actually the most abundant chemical on earth is seawater, okay? It's a very consult concentrated solution. Uh, and if we want to look for, if we look at the composition, we see that uh, in uh, one kilogram of seawater, we have about 10 grams of sodium. So this means that we have like 1% of sodium um, per kilogram of, uh, material to be processed. And uh, from the mining point of view, this is an exceptionally high concentration, okay? Uh, usually on, on the seaside, we also have a lot of uh, available, uh, a lot of, we have available a lot of renewable energy, both as wind, as well as uh, can be like uh, uh, streams and so on. So we can actually produce energy on site and use the seawater in uh, in in a seawater battery to to actually store energy and release it. Okay, so a seawater battery is an electrochemical device in which there is a, a solid electrolyte separating the sodium, let's say, side from the uh, seawater side because sodium and seawater should never get in direct contact. And it can be this this system can be used actually to extract sodium. Uh, in, in, in form of metal or other forms out of the seawater. And then this sodium can be uh, collected and stored for, for delayed or shifted use. Okay, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, this kind of, of cells, of uh, seawater cells are usually uh, sustainable and pretty efficient. In fact, they don't use uh, uh, much 
or uh, very critical raw materials. And at least in the lab scale, they can have a pretty high round trip efficiencies, uh, above 70%. Um, just to give you an idea of how they work. Uh, so uh, there is a negative electrode is uh, sodium uh, electrode. I mean, there is no sodium at the beginning. Sodium is actually extracted using electricity uh, from the seawater. And during the charge, the, the, there is this process that accumulates sodium into the negative electrode or into a, a special reservoir. And at the same time, uh, it produces chlorine, which is a precious chemical that can be used for, uh, for uh, um, the chemical industries or uh, you know, for, uh, for example, disinfectants, but also the, the polymer industry and so on. But the other great byproduct, it is actually uh, H2O. So extracting sodium and chlorine out of, uh, out of water means that we are generating a lot of desalinized water, which can be used for industrial uses as well as for agriculture. During discharge, on the other end, sodium is injected again into the seawater and uh, as a sodium ion. And uh, the reaction involves also um, water and oxygen. And the, the, uh, the final byproduct during the charge is, is actually the production of sodium hydroxide, which is uh, great for CO2 trapping because it can actually block, um, it can actually re react with CO2 and form sodium carbonate, which is a solid and can be set uh, aside for. Uh, infinitely long uh, CO2 trapping. So um, these were just example on how electrochemistry can support uh, uh, can support the the uh, energy transition and the decarbonization of Europe. But what is really important and what I, I the message I want to really give up of this presentation is that we should really focus on energy storage, especially long-term energy storage, if we want to uh, meet the target of a full decarbonization of Europe. And also, and this, is, this became very evident with the crisis, we are uh, Ukrainian crisis, if we really want to reach energy independence from the rest of the world. Europe, since long time, Europe is depending on the rest of the world for our energy needs but making uh, um, an efficient energy efficient energy storage then we can actually be, produce our own energy store it by produce our own energy via renewables and store it uh, for for our needs okay and this is actually the base of storage project okay um uh, some numbers of figures. Uh, Story, Stories is a project which is running uh, since the 1st of November 2021. It's a four-year project. It has a, a pretty large budget, 7 million euros. Um, and I have to say that this budget is mostly devoted for the formation of the ecosystems. I will uh, talk a little bit later. And it does not go to the partners, mostly, or to the beneficiaries. Uh, uh, especially well, to the beneficiaries, yes, but not to the partners. And KIT is the coordinator of this project. The main objective, as I said, are, are the establishments of ecosystems. Because uh, so far, you, Europe did not really uh, um, solve the problem of energy storage. I mean, the energy storage in Europe meant burning fossil fuels when energy is needed, okay? Sometimes you hear a presentation and they talk about energy storage in terms of uh, capability of or power of production of energy. Power, power. Uh, I mean, the, cap the, the power capability to produce energy because it is intended that anyway, fossil fuels are available, okay? Um, in some cases, some hybrid uh, like uh, pumped hydro or hydropower, uh, pumped hydro is actually storage, hydropower is only production. 
are available and these are used to for peak shaving but we do not have any way right now to store the energy we will need in especially next winter okay so we really want to foster a european ecosystem of industrial research and organization on hybrid energy storage technologies why am i insisting on hybrid because there is no storage technologies that can cover all the needs, the energy needs of, of, of a continent like Europe, okay? Which can be very local, very short time to very uh, continent-based, uh, let's say, a very long time as, for example, winter, okay? Then we, we will want to provide access to a world-class um, um, infrastructure for materials and energy storage related research. Okay, so um, the, the beneficiaries of um, and the research infrastructure made available via stories um, are, are really uh, high quality. Okay, we want to enlarge and advance the integration of the European energy storage community. Again, uh, Right now, energy storage is, is foreseen a uh, kind of a not integrated approach, okay? And we want to enhance innovation uh, in the field of energy storage by involving industry experts in the setting up and implementing of a proactive innovation support scheme, okay? Um, the, the way we are making these lectures is to ensure the long-term sustainability of energy storage uh, research by setting up a framework for the scientific and technical training of young researchers, um, which have a kind of holistic approach on energy storage rather than a very specific one on, on specific energy storage technologies which uh, obviously will help, uh, and, and we also would like to define scenarios and strategic roadmaps for the energy storage in general, and promote and coordinate the international cooperation in energy storage research from and to uh, Europe. Um, yeah, I mentioned before the, the structure of the uh, project. Okay, so we have 17 members, full participants, we have uh, uh, 12 subcontractors and 18 linked par third parties bound to the full participant of, uh, of, uh, of the project. And then we have uh, um, many research facilities which are associated to us. So we can, uh, as I will uh, show later, we can allow scientists and engineers from industry and academia to have access to the these uh, um, world-class infrastructures. And we are obviously also involved in the project and advisory board, which will help us to, to take the right direction, selection panel for the codes that I will describe a little bit later, and an extended network to get feedback from the community. Okay, so these are the main outcomes which we expect. Uh, there are these, six transnational access calls that is the these are the calls to get access to the research infrastructure i will go into details later um, our main target is to favor the establishment of materials acceleration platform specific for energy storage okay a roadmap for the hybridization of energy storage which is definitely uh, needed uh, to be sure that we will have an efficient and effective energy storage uh, system in Europe, okay? And, and in order to uh, then achieve the, the objectives and, and to achieve this uh, energy independence via energy storage, we will also draft a strategic research and innovation agenda, uh, write a white paper on open data in the energy storage community, establish uh, a series of workshops on sustainable energy storage and then draft a white paper on sustainable hybrid energy storage for the European uh, CET, <coughs> Clean uh, Energy Technology. 
international mobility scheme is also very important. We favor the uh, um, um, visit of uh, scientists from both industry and academia from um, even outside of Europe, actually, not only in Europe. We are uh, working on the establishment of the university master program of hybridization on hybridization of energy storage again because we really want to have uh, uh, young scientists being or and engineers being trained on this holistic approach of energy storage rather than specific technology approach and and, and also three summer schools everybody is invited to join uh, in the extended network and participate as well as to take advantage of this transnational access code, which I'm uh, giving more details now. So as I mentioned before, stories can grant free access to 64 world leading research infrastructure on subject uh, um, related with hybrid energy storage. Stories will cover the cost the travel and accommodation costs for the uh, scientists and engineer visiting these facilities and will also uh, support uh, these uh, facilities for their own internal cost. And the, the, the um, calls are open to all researchers from academia and industry, from EU members, as well as EU associated states which are listed there and we will actually open a call every six months so the next one is already open actually the deadline is coming very soon but since uh, end of july but since we are in summer we most likely prolong the deadline so everybody wants to uh, take advantage of these uh, facilities which are as you can see on the map on the right distributed distributed all over europe from the north to the south from west to east Okay, um, you can just participate. Um, I, I mean, to have an idea what are the research infrastructures available, you can connect to this website and you will see that we have 58 physical infrastructure. That doesn't mean you can run only physics experiment, but they exist. So you can run experiment, also chemical experiments. Or um, then we have six virtual infrastructures. That means you can, for example, uh, make use of uh, of, um, um, of uh, supercomputers. For example, one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world is uh, is made available for within these calls and is offered by any the uh, ENI, the Italian oil company. Okay. Um, and in, within this infrastructure, we are also, uh, actually covering all the, the, let's say, established energy storage technologies, electrochemical, thermal, chemical, thermal, mechanical, superconducting. And we also have offer uh, infrastructure uh, dedicated to cross-cutting activities, so which are actually the best one, because we really would like to uh, favor this hybrid uh, hybrid. Uh, energy storage development and the, the various facilities infrastructures can actually cover uh, very different levels of research going from uh, TRL 1 to 6. So if you are interested, please take a look to the stories uh, um, EU website and then you will find all the information. Yeah, so um, I'm not going to run all the videos, but if you connect to the um, storiesproject.eu, you can find all the information uh, you want about this research infrastructure. The only requirement is that if you are from a certain given country, you cannot visit a research infrastructure in the, or be a guest in a research infrastructure in the same country. This is a requirement of the European Union. So if you are a Located in Germany, you should either visit, uh, you should visit, uh, uh, or you can only visit or spend time or be host or be uh, in, in research infrastructure in different uh, countries. And for any other information you may want to have about stories, uh, you can contact the team at uh, uh, KIT and we will support you in any possible way.
So I want to thank you now for the um, for listening, and uh, I hope to see you uh, visiting one of these research infrastructures soon.